1776. In fact, that Roman numeral up under there is 1776. In fact, that pyramid and all seeing that probably was never even seen visually by George Washington in his whole fucking life. But what do that mean? Why would a bunch of white boys, masons, put a symbol of what they call the great architect on their most commonly used currency, but then go out and call the rims of that briefness of a man? But then they were what they call Freemasons, so if you was only three-fifths of a guy, you couldn't get in it, even though it was yours to begin with. That's a whole nother story. Now, of course, Tony Browder in the Browder file, everybody should have had a Browder file. In the Browder file, he'll go through all of the things relevant to what's on the eagle and the, uh, on the other side, the phoenix. Of course, it was drawn as a phoenix. Now, a guy named Manly Palmer Hall, who is a an old white dusty guy who died recently is an expert in Masonic writings, once wrote a book called The Secret Destiny of America. And in that book, and he's known for writing over 2,000 different Masonic books, in that book he talks about the pyramid and the all-seeing eye, but most importantly he shows that that phoenix is in fact a phoenix and not an eagle. That's important because the phoenix is a bird that has a 500-year relationship mythical African. 500 years seems to coincide from 1492 to 1992. The dumbest people on the planet in 1492 thought the world was square. They were so dumb. But by 1992, the dumbest beast, cave dwellingness, evil, contempt for God, contempt for nature, hate for the direct descendants of God Almighty has risen up and conquered the planet in 499 years, and he's about to sit in his chair, 1992. That's important because where they are is as important as where we are. And of course he does the symbolism of the phoenix knowing the bird up versus the eagle to head down. If you're in Washington, D.C., go to Freedom Plaza on 1400 Pennsylvania Avenue and look into the ground of Freedom Plaza, our big seals. And you will see the original seal from the 1700s and the reconstructed seal in the 1800s that made that a bald eagle and not a phoenix. And you will then see the coding of the 13s and the 13 mentioned 13 times. Okay? But this evidence of a secret society. These masons had broke away from the British on the cover, but were secretly linked to the British through secret Masonic lodges who were chartered by the British. That's why you, when you talk about skull and bones, remember it is charted by some Germans. So when the question comes up, where did the Illuminati go in 1782 when it got crushed? It went up into the University of Ingolstadt and submerged itself in other secret societies until it reemerged as a part of skull and bones in 1832. Now, Alfonso Taft is a part of the Taft family that has run Ohio still to this day. Anybody here from Ohio? Anybody here from Ohio will tell you that the Taft's been running it since it was a state. Senators, congressmen, a Taft now just becomes Secretary of State. Uh, another Taft is head of uh, NATO. Another Taft just died. But the son of Alfonso Taft, the co-founder of Skull and Bones, his son is named William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft is the only man in the history of America to become Chief Justice and President. That's important. Now, Skull and Bones at Yale University is a postgraduate secret society. What's important about that? Which means that you go through your initiation in your senior year, but the real activity with the organization is after graduation. Now, when you go through the initiation rites, they give you $15,000 cash and a promise of lifetime success if you obey the laws of the skull and bones. Interestingly enough, in the story they did on Channel 9 in the Washington, D.C. on skull and bones recently, last week, they mentioned that when skull and bones is mentioned, you have to walk out of the room. So they showed Senator Bob Curry being asked about skull and bones and he says, now, Senator, I hear when they mention skull and bones, you got to leave. He says, bye. 
Then they showed another time when a brother asked Bush when he was sitting with a dignity, dignitary, said, Mr. Bush, are you in Skull and Bones? And Bush looked right at him and he says, I'm not leaving the room. That's cold talk. Now, sources on Skull and Bones. Best source, several. One book called America's Secret Establishment by a professor uh, from University of California named Anthony Sutton. I got a copy of the book up here somewhere. I want to show you the cover. America's Secret Establishment. Got a whole break of the Brundies, the Harrimans, the Lords, the Pillsburys, the Tafts, and all the major families that were involved in the book, but uh, exhibit number whatever, an introduction into the order of skull and bones. Now, what this book does is show you, in fact, there's small versions of this because he put them out in booklet form like this before he put it in a big book like this. There are four booklets that go into this book. But if you get any of them, uh, did y'all sell books here? Well, we need to, I need to show you some places to order. When they hear the tapes, they're going to add, they go, but you sell hundreds of these. Okay, so we need to get them. Now, Another source is Esquire Magazine, September 1977. An uh, article by a guy named Rosenblum. Of course, he's Jewish. He wrote an article called The Last Rites of Skull and Bones, something like that. And it appeared in Esquire Magazine, September 1977. It's a good article because it has some interesting things in it. It mentions that also, besides laying in a coffin to do your initiation, after you lay in the coffin butt naked, you got to get out and jump in a pile of mud and wrestle with your fellow initiates, again, butt naked. We ought to ask Bush why he was sliding all around his brother, man. Did he slip up and catch one of them? We need to check that out. Now, one of the things they do in Skull and Bones is they have a little ritual. They the initiate and they set him at a table. They put two skulls on the table, skeleton heads. They tell the initiate, I want you to look at these two skulls and I want you to tell me which one is the fool and which one is the wise man. He said, after that, I want you to tell me which one is the rich man and which one is the beggar. Now the initiate, he looking all over the skulls, he looking, shit time passing. The, the, they stand there just looking at him, right? Wondering when he gonna figure it out that he can't tell the difference. Right? Because the lesson they're teaching the initiate, their language is when you're dead, you're dead. Meaning you can't tell when you're dead whether you was a rich man or a beggar, a fool or a wise man. So kick that ass while you live in fuck heaven. White people are linear. Oh now, watch them now. White people are linear, they just do shit. Right? They don't stand to count for nothing. Right? Of course, we're African people. We're circular. You reap what you sow. Cause and effect. What go around, come around. Eye for an eye. Those are the laws that are known in the African tradition. We sit in circles. But the white man, he linear. <laughs> right? That's Hey, but check out what they do. Up in the ritual, in the Masonic and in the Skull and Bones, they say, look, trust no one who believes in heaven, for they'll suffer hell while they're on earth. Amen. Now, don't that sound like that? Don't that sound? Yeah. To teach a person in a secret society, trust no one who believes in heaven, means that the believers in heaven are vulnerable to pain while on earth. Now, it's all right of believing in heaven, but fuck retribution. We can deliver it while we're here. God would have wanted it that way. Okay, we did that one. Okay, 15 members in their junior. When you're in your junior, when you're in your senior year, if you're picked as a junior, when you're in senior year, you become known as a knight. When you graduate, you're known as a patriarch. Now, a knight draw similar connections to something called the Knights of Templar. Now we got to get into the Knights of Templar. They use the cross and they use the king's crown for symbols. Now this is important because that'll lead you to a guy named Jacques de Molay. 
Now let's get with it. Now you gotta do this. Jean Molay is the last known publicly Knights of Templar who was burned at the stake in 1314 by two people. The king, King Philip somebody, and the Pope, Pope Clement. Now this is heavy because in the ritual of the 29th and 30th degree of the Scottish Rite Masons, they use the same skulls in the ceremony like they do in Skull and Bones. But in this one, they put three skulls on it. They put two skulls next to the skull in the middle. They tell the initiate that the skull in the middle is demolay. And that demolay is surrounded by the church and the state the Pope, and the King. And that for Demolay's linear to succeed, you have to neutralize them both, the church and the state. That's heavy. That's heavy because when you go to the so-called taking of this country, it was a Masonic takeover, nothing less. There was no loose ends on the takeover of America. It was a Masonic activity. Now. That's why their symbols are on the dollar bill. Oh, interestingly enough, when they have their meetings in Skull and Bones, they meet at 8 o'clock. I noticed one interesting thing that Malcolm mentioned in autobiography is that when, the, when they kept threatening to kill him, they kept calling him at 8 o'clock. See, and I take things as cold. Nothing happens that happens to me. So he keeps getting these calls at 8 o'clock, and every time the bondsmen pose for pictures, they put a grandfather clock behind them, and it, it's at 8 o'clock. In fact, when you go over, beside getting 15,000, you get a grandfather clock. Now, we did that one. Let's go back to Demo Lane. Now, in Washington, D.C., there's a Masonic temple called the, uh, the uh, George Washington Masonic Memorial. It's in Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. I got a picture of it right here. It's open to the public. When you're in Washington, D.C., you should go there. Here's a copy of the people who are working. Here's a copy of it here. You can take the metro there. You can go on tours of it. It's the George Washington Memorial Masonic Temple. What's so important about it is, is that in the basement is a, is a, a little uh, video play of the Order of Demolay. You see, when you are Mason, the Masonic Youth Organization is called the Order of the Demolay. Now check this out, this is deep. George Bush was sworn in with the Bible that George Washington was sworn in with. That Bible had never moved from the time George Washington used it. But the Bible come from the Masonic Lodge in New York, St. John's Masonic Lodge. And it was taken by a guy named Robert Livingston, who was head of the Masons in New York at that time. You got Livingston Street running right down the street that we drove down to get up in here before we come across the Brooklyn Bridge and go there. We come past Livingston Street, a diagonal street, right? These things are not arbitrarily named either. And Livingston was the guy who ran the Masons and the, and the Bible that he used for George Washington was never used till George Bush used it, and he was sworn in by Potter Stewart, Skull and Bones man, who was on the Supreme Court at that time. Now, the interesting thing is, is that that Masonic Bible is now at the Virginia Temple, and it's opened up to a certain page in a case, the Songs of Solomon, right? Now check this out. The Masonics prided themselves in controlling the law. Counsel, tell me if this is so, that you just went to jury duty? When you go to court, you raise your right hand and you say what? I do solemnly swear. Now you ain't arbitrarily swearing on solemnly. It is for your understanding that all oaths are sworn on Solomon, and the songs of Solomon say, I am black, I am black, I'm black, black. Yeah. Now let's pick it up. Some coded shit in here somewhere. Now, now I don't know everything. 
understand. Let me just say, I don't know everything. I'm a humble child standing before you, thrusting before you the little things that I do know so that they can fit the things that you know so that together we can make a better. That's the best I can do. That's the best I can do. There may be people who know this better than me. Many times when we talk like this, it sets the climate so that we can carry the discussion further because many times people that know feel that the other people don't care, so they never say. Okay? So sometimes uh, somebody throws the stick down and lays the tent over and Copley comes under it and it stops some of the rain and others come in too. And we get to add clarity to things that we need to know. Now, I'm down in the Masonic Temple I'm down in the Masonic Temple and I'm looking at this display they got on the order of the Demole, which is the Masonic Youth Organization from 13 to 21. See, you can't be no Mason until you're over 21, I think. So, but you gotta be in the order of the Demole. Now, the order of the Demole has a picture of the youth that goes through the ceremony and it says for their oath, I do so promise. But you look, there's a blank where Solomon could go in it. See what it says, I do so, and then it's blank, and then it goes to the next line. See, since you're just a shorty, you do so swear. When you become a longie, you do solemnly swear. And there's the picture of the Masonic uh, youth in his little garb, saying before the table with the three books with the, with the, with the string around it, over a Bible, where they do their ritual, but isn't it strange that the Masons have a train down for their youth preparing to replace what they call themselves as the successors to the ancient Egyptians? See, somebody say, why you fuck with the Masons? Because when you read the white Mason stuff, they say they're the successors to the ancient Egyptians, but I don't know, I know it's at the beginning and the end. I don't know about what they're talking about. I don't know nothing about that. In fact, Napoleon was a Mason. What did he do when he got to the Sphinx? But now that he's a mason, it would make sense since he wants to that was his thing when he knew it was your thing. 21 gun salute. Right on the nose. Michael did it at his own, on his own expense. Anyway, that's nothing. Anyway. Now what was interesting was that while I was in, while I was there, and I looked at the little brochure of the Demole. It says Demolay was started more than 70 years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. I said, oh, that's great. But just so happened my next speaking engagement was Kansas City, Missouri. I said, great. So I called my friend and said, hey, when I get there, we got to go on a mission. Now, anybody know, and I haven't done it here, I need help. I need to go around and put on videotape many of the symbols that are here in New York. Your city is Masonically coded, just like Washington, D.C., Chicago, L.A., Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. They all, Indianapolis, Lafayette, Indiana, they all Masonically connected by their street names, their meridians, their drives, where their Scottish Rite Temple is located. It just has to be declined. I need to go to these spots to put these things on film and to look at them carefully. Philadelphia is heavily loaded with it, Washington, D.C., uh, just all over the place, and we need to decodify it. Uh, I have, and I'm about to release soon a videotape when I get back to Chicago, I'm going to edit it. For example, I went to L.A. In L.A., the Scottish Rite Temple is at Wilshire and Crenshaw. What's important about that is Crenshaw is the black street, Wilshire is the white street, and it comes to a point. And then they have 33 statues, and it starts off with an African M Hotel and ends with George Washington. Now that's something going on there. When you go to Kansas City, Missouri, the Scottish Rite Temple is up on Linwood Boulevard at what's known as the highest point of Kansas City. Kansas, excuse me, Kansas City, Missouri, which across the bridge is Kansas City, Kansas, where all of the Masonic temples, the police association, and everything is on 7th Street. Right when you're in Kansas City, Missouri, look at the war memorial set up in 1918 to honor the end of World War I and the spirit of the League of Nations, which accomplished what couldn't be done until later through the United Nations. Land donated by Rockefeller, so on and so forth. But go check that in Kansas City, Missouri, you see a big oblique, you see sphinxes with shrouds over them. All these things you need to check, I'll just tell you, tell you them in the record. When you go to these cities, you can check for yourselves. 
When you're in Cincinnati, go to Eden Park. In Eden Park, at the top of Eden Park, uh, Cincinnati is laid off like Rome. They got seven hills there, Eden Park. It's got a statue in it, don donated from the mayor of Rome, called Romulus and Remus, which is the little white babies sucking the, the bowels of the wolf for nourishment. And we know that the reason that milk don't go in our stomach is because we ain't no damn beasts. And because we ain't a BC, now I see they got some stuff called lactose comma or something. You can eat this little pill and you digest beast milk. That's a whole nother dialogue. That's a whole, we gotta get into that one. But anyway, anyway, Kansas City, you will see out near the airport. I told everybody, I asked Kansas City packed house, tell me what the demole is. Now one single black person in Kansas City knew what the demole was. But it's the training ground for the Masonic use, and the black people in Kansas City didn't even know there was such a thing. So we go to the Demolay headquarters, and there it is laying there looking like a triangle with that pyramid. We all in the windows beating on the doors. I mean, let us in there. We wanted well, all around it was all kind of Masonic stuff. But the people there were excited to start to get a handle on the decodification of the things that are right in their face, but without knowing the code that's of no use to them. Now, this, uh, this uh, 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 Masonic thing is interesting because in Washington, D.C., they have what's called the House of the Mother Supreme. The House of the Mother Supreme is the headquarters of 33 states. The Masonic Scottish Rite is drawn up into 33 states for the South and 17 states for the North. Now, why is that? I don't know. The 33 states in the South headquarters is right there at 16th Street in Washington, D.C. Of course, everything there is coded. The steps go 3579, they phone number 3579. When you walk in, you look right on the lights, every light got a picture of Hermes on it. You say, who that? They say, oh, that's Hermes. They say, in fact, we got a room downstairs where the documents are hermetically sealed. Now, Hermes is some stealing some African stuff. But they, of course, manipulate these things. In fact, they had one room down there, interestingly enough, had a gate on it. They wouldn't let us in it. And I'll show you right in the book, the room has a gate on it. They won't let the public in it. And if you look at the room, you can see it's uh, got a, a bars around it. It says, let no one enter my oh, one ignorant of geometry enter my doors. Of course, geometry has, and Pythagoras, and the theorem, and all of that has something to do about the things they be doing. That, that's what it says around there, let no one ignorant of geometry enter my doors. I said, what's in there? He said, all our hermetically sealed records. Of course, they call Hermes the bearer of light. And uh, that goes through a whole nother thing. Interestingly enough, here's the front of the temple. The temple upon the symbolism of the Temple of Solomon. In fact, many of them are Masonic temples and they got 33 columns going around the building. Each column is 33 feet high. They got two shrouds, two, two major sphinxes in the front, and they mentioned that the two monumental sphinx placed at the left and right of the uppermost flight of stairs guard the temple's door. Symbolizing wisdom, the one on the right has half-closed eyes and serene features. Symbolizing power, its main left has a wide open eye and an alert, determined aspect. The rising above the sphinxes are 33 columns, each 33 feet tall. And there are pictures of the two sphinxes. You see they got onyxes all in the front of them. And behind them is, of course, the lotus flower that doesn't even count for their being made. In fact, I tell you, I don't know where the white people come from. I used to think they evolved from us. But I ain't never seen no gorilla live in no cave. I ain't never seen that. Gorilla still don't eat meat. He, he ate dog, cat, rat, wife, child, anything he can get his paws on. Now, here they got a great stairway. They call it the Great Staircase. Each of the stairs are numbered, leading up to a bust of Albert Pike. The Scottish Rite thing is based upon the re reformist attitudes of Albert Pike, who is known as the, uh, who wrote their Bible called Morals and Dogma. That's the Masonic Bible. I think I may got a copy over here. No, I, I must have left it. 
the uh, morals and dogma. That's the Bible. And when you read their book, here's a book of theirs called A Bridge to Light. This is a book going through all the ceremonies of the Scottish Rite with all of the symbolism. I hope you can get some of this on the camera. Come on, camera. Y'all got to work. <laughs> And uh, here, for every one of their rituals, is all of the symbolism, with all of the breakdown from the morals and dogma, and all the things that have to be used. Interestingly enough, I took this book to Kansas City to show you the different uh, symbols for every one of their degrees. They show all of the rituals, the aprons. You can see there's an apron with a head and the swords crossed, and all of the things they have to use as part of the each step from four to 32. Now, of course, this, uh, this Scottish Rite thing, uh, this book here is very heavy. If you feel it, it's very heavy. When you look at it, it's 340 pages. I took it to a printer. He said, Steve, this cover is 10 pages meshed together. This back cover is 10 pages meshed together. And 340 plus 20 is 360. And the book weighs a certain thing, and the weight of the book is masonically coded as well. These numbers are no arbitrary things because the Masons are in the numerology. Of course, those are all things that you taught them. Now, when you go to these tours, you can tour this house of the mother. You play with the little tour guide, right? He checks you out to see if you know anything, you know? He says, well, this is actually, uh, that Hebrew there is actually what Solomon and them was talking about. Oh, no, man, Solomon and then use Hebrew. Oh, well, uh, maybe that's something else. See, he tell you one thing and lie to you, and only if you know the truth can you challenge him and force him up to give better clarity. So you go in there, you say, uh, uh, he says, now this is my favorite book. I look down at it, and it's in a foreign language. I said, well, what do it say? He said, I don't know, I can't read it. I said, well, how is it your favorite book? He said, I don't know. He's just checking you out. But you go on the tour, and interestingly enough, we start messing with it, right? We say, well, uh, let's see here. Since you all, see the white boy Masons got a thing saying that the Prince Hall ain't the real Masons because they can't find their charter. But in the Prince Hall thing, they'll tell you the story about the Boston Tea Party wasn't about taxation without representation. It was about 12 Masons dressed up as Indians going on the boat, overthrowing the crew, trying to find the charter that was sent from the British Lodge to Prince Hall. <laughs> But you will have to sit with your Prince Hall Mason so that they can clarify those stories for you. So they try to say that Prince Hall ain't legit because he ain't got no charter. So we say, well, only white boy, I'll fight you to trace your charter back. See, then he get, he get to challenge him. He said, well, actually, we're all the way back at 735 with St. Uh, uh, Augustana going backwards. I said, well, when you finish, we'll see you when you get there. You see, when they go back, they're just going back to you. They're trying to trace how far they can trace back to you. Of course, in Stolen Legacy, he clearly identifies that all of the white masonry stuff is just stuff taken from the ancient mystery schools taught to all men who are part of an African society. But the danger, again, that they present is that within their dialogue, they say, we ain't shit, and that they are the successors to all that we were. So the problem is, is that they see us as something to be conquered. I will suggest to you that the reason the pyramid and the all-seeing eye is on the dollar bill because they will know when they have won when they take the pyramids. And don't say they won't take them. They got a 400,000 strong military sitting just across the river. Don't they? And they got them there under the guise of the Persian Gulf. Now, interestingly enough, when you go to that 29th and 30th right of the Scottish Rite, you get into the order of Demolay and the things that they say about the ritual process between Demolay, the Prince, and the Knights of Templar. This is all very important. This book is called A Bridge to Light. And the Masons say that this rainbow is an important symbol of Masonic activity. I said, boy, I can't wait to ask Jesse. <laughs> Why he picked the Rainbow Coalition <laughs> when the rainbow means something especially Masonic and uh, they even put it right on their book, A Bridge to Light.
which is an $8 book you can get when you go to the temple. Now, when we went to the temple, we were asking for all kind of books that they didn't want to sell us. See, when you come in, they say, are you a mason? We said, oh, no, we're not. In fact, we say very clearly, we're of a higher order. See, I use, a, I use on my logo something that looks like an eye in the keyhole. So when they get to talking stuff one way, we just show out and say, oh, no, we're from a higher order. They get to, well, what's that eye? When they enter these eyes. They be watching you when you start doing things beyond what they understand. So you just flash it and pull it back. Right? And out in the back, you will see my button, Steve Coakley, name and names. You'll see that eye faded in the background. Now I have a black eye that I don't have many more of. I think they're all gone, but when we giving away that free food from them greenhouses that are just about to become in harvest that anybody with that black eye gonna get some free food before we then start to use the food in other ways. Uh, but we'll talk about the greenhouse system too because for the cost of a used car you could feed a neighborhood, right? And uh, we don't feed each other in Africa starving but for the cost of $12,000 we could build a solar power system that could use raw, the hottest damn thing burning all in Africa all day long and put up so much electricity in the middle of the day that we could export the electricity in a power cell. But, but that's a whole nother subject because you say, you ain't got no fucking solution. You when you lay this shit right out there and tell them how easy it is, they say, well, why ain't nobody done it? Because ain't nobody trying to win the damn thing. See, we all struggling, but we ain't trying to win. This is based upon trying to find the moment when we can get the beast, which by itself is very strong, well planted. We know well strong, well planted with the tanks and the cruise missiles and the, uh, or what's that thing, self bomber and all of that. We know well planted, he's difficult to beat. But we also know that we can so instigate him that we can get him all wild and woolly and up on his legs and hinds and all wild so that it would just take something simple just to push him over once we've sucked him up off of his legs. See, every time you start going at him, he gets all wild and woolly. He's so mad at this brother, he suspended him like he suspended no one ever. Because see, he's all like, they take it. He's, he's mad because when he told you to be quiet and shut up, you kept going. See, he said, well, maybe he ain't of our order. You see, the reality is, the reality is, is that Everybody ain't of the nature of the beast, so he don't have control over everything. See, when they got to Milli Vanilli and said, well, why was you mouthing a song you didn't sing? They said, we made a deal with the devil. Now, right? That's, that's clear to me. And everybody will tell you about the day that they had to cut a deal to stay in the game. You see, it's really the virgins versus the horse. You take a hundred virgins who might not know everything, might not be on all of the things, you have more moral and spiritual power there than a thousand whores. So always when you're with the young, pledge and support their keeping their values and their principles and their virginity because the confidence to fight comes out of the cleansiness of your activity. Now, in the house of the Mother Supreme is a room for the astronauts. They got an astronaut room there. And they got replicas of the flag that the dude took and put on the moon. The flag of the house of the Mother Supreme, he put it on the moon when he went up there. Remember when they did that one small step for mankind shit? He put the Masonic flag on the moon. And they got a copy of it in that, in that uh, house of the Mother Supreme. But they also got a Jagger Hoover room there. Now that's very important that in the Masonic temple, house of the Mother Supreme, is a J. Edgar Hoover room because Hoover was a 33rd degree mason. But we also remember Hoover for running the coin and tell pro program that had him monitoring the rise of a because as a mason he know it ain't a white one. Okay? Now, all the entry level Masonic books all carry blue covers. Because lower lodges of masonry, one, two, and three, are called the blue lodges. But we know that the masons pride themselves in control of the law, so they also infiltrated heavily law enforcement. All of the police units are called blue lights. All over the country, they changed all the lights to blue lights. 
Correct? Well, you don't know that. Yes, correct. Now, police organizations are called what? Fraternal orders of police. Come on, Africans. They're fraternal. That's all the police organizations are fraternal orders or the benevolent something or another. Am I right or wrong? Now, do you think that while you up in the criminal court building, they all standing on the square and doing all kind of shit, and you suffering, that they don't know something that we don't? So what I'm telling to you is that the Muscat activity infiltrated the implementation of the law. And they all work under the blue-coated system. The lower lodges, one, two, and three, are blue lodges. It isn't until you get to the fourth degree that you can then get off into the Masonic Scottish Rite thing and the Albert Pike say that in the first three lodges, they only think they know the truth. It isn't until the fourth that we start to teach them, but what you learn in the first three is the crest of the law enforcement system, which is what? Hold of silence. That's what you pick up in one, two, and three, to shut the fuck up. <laughs> and that is the crest of police work. Okay? Now, we also found when we went in there, we found some other Masonic things. Now, the Masonic male thing is the order of the Demole. The Masonic females is the International Daughters of Job or something. Now, there's a book that you should get on the Masons called Beyond the Lodge Door. Uh, Paul Fisher, excellent book. It's a white boy who walks through the Masonic thing and just tells you what he sees. Now, how do you use a book? When I first started giving lectures on the Trilateral Commission, my obligation to my client, you, was this, that I should go to the right wing and get all of theirs, go to the left wing and get all of theirs, go to the Trilateral and get all of theirs, and from that come out with an Afrocentric ours. The trilateral 101 and the other that are back there related to them are the consolidation of all sides. It would be no good to take the right and not the left, or the left and the right and not them themselves. So when we go into the Masonic thing, I would do the best to lay to you sources from all angles because it's the extraction of the best of that. And what you will see in here is a breakdown on when the Masons dominated the Congress, which years, and what did they pass when the Masons dominated the Supreme Court, which years and what has. You will also get John Crowes, who is buried in the house of the Mother Supreme, as well as Albert Pike. You will get quotes from them that are predominantly white supremacists, in fact, condemning black people as being animals and less than a man. These are important when you're challenging white supremacy is to know the signposts of the things they believe in so that you can always use your disqualifying statements on them. But you have to know them so you can use them. <laughs> Behind the Lodge Door is an important book for that process. So that Albert Pike's body is buried in this house of the Mother Supreme Temple. What's that? Okay. Now, uh, they also got a thing in there where they got pennies. They got a thing called the York Wright Room. See, they say that when you get to the 32nd degree, you leave the, the Bible and you go to the Quran. Now, that's heavy. Now, that's why the Catholics say you can't be no Mason. Now, they've had some trouble enforcing their terms. You see, Pope John Paul I said he wanted all Catholics out of Masonic activity. Remember, they had a thing called the P2. Get a book called In God's Name by David Yallop. In God's Name. It is the book that reveals the relationship between the Catholic Church and the P2 Masonic sect. Let me see if I had a cover. I don't think I got the cover up here to show you. Oh, here it is. In God's Name. Uh, the investigation into the murder of John Paul I. Now, how many of you all saw Godfather Part Three? Well, in that, you saw the murder of John Paul I depicted. The godfather who had cut a deal with the Catholic Church. Remember, you give him big money. He's now becoming legitimate. And he's at the opera listening to his son give opera. And they come in and get him and say, we need to help our friend the Pope. He says, that Pope got too many enemies. I don't think we can help him. And then you see him show him laying there with his hand across him, the Pope. And they say, the Pope's dead. 
Well, that Pope, John Paul I, died in his 33rd day in office, just 33 days. After being selected, he was killed. Supposedly still of undetermined causes, but what's so important about it is, is that he was the youngest pope in the history of the Catholic Church. He was just 53. He could have been pope 50 years. See, you pope till you die. Right? Now check this out. So he declares in his second day in office that the man's got to get out. And 31 days later, they got him flat on his back, dead in the doorknob. Right? Now, the next guy say, I'll be John Paul II. So he jumps out and reinforces the declaration of John Paul I. They shoot his ass right in the belly, didn't they? Didn't they? And he went to the Our Lady of Fatima just last week and put the bullet shrapnel from his stomach in the crown of diamonds, the hardest known mineral, and put it on head, saying she saved him. He don't play that Mason stuff no more. He said, y'all can be in the Masons. Y'all can do whatever you want to do. Right? And that's, that's the deal. So they do whatever they want to do now. We also found something in there called the High 12. The High 12 International. I never heard of this shit. The High 12 is an association of master Masons who desire an hour of Masonic fellowship independent of the formal of the lodge, but dedicated to the service of the fraternity. You see three pyramid-looking things? Three pyramid-looking things? In fact, you, our, our leaders of tomorrow got the Job Daughters and the Triangle look like Girl Scouts, the Demole, and the Rainbow Girls, with, with some on the chain or something, some things of theirs. And they have the High Twelve. We also found something called the Tall Cedars of Lebanon of North America which is another interlocutionic relationship. Its history is after the tall cedars of Lebanon in 72 was welcomed by the board of directors to the memorial to establish its place in the National Shrine of Freemasonry. And it mentions that they had the tall cedar room is the reconstruction of King Solomon's temple. The tall cedars had something to do with the building of Solomon's temple and they have a Masonic offshoot. We also found some, uh, where's this other one here called? We got something here, something else they got in there. Where they at? The high 12 and the something else. I had to find the, uh, oh, Walcott Foundation. The Walcott Foundation has a program at George Washington's University where they uh, give away grants for people who will go into government service. Now, that's very important, too. Now, if you remember FEMA, right? You talked about FEMA? I want you to check this if this is so. Anytime you have a place that is a bomb shelter, right? The bomb shelter has the civil defense logo. The civil defense agency is a part of FEMA. In the book, Organizing FEMA from the federal government is coded in blue. And the logo of FEMA is a circle, in fact, I think it's better seen here, a circle with a pyramid in it. Now what's so interesting about FEMA's logo being the eagle with a circle with a pyramid in it that that same pyramid or triangle is the logo for the triangle papers of the Trilateral Commission. They call them triangle papers. In fact, their logo has three, three, uh, three uh, arrows going in a swirl, and the recycling logo, which is now on napkins, McDonald bags, and everything else, is the same three-sided arrows. Accident or coincidence. And uh, I think that's very important, just like that phrase for the Marines is also Masonically coded. You'll see that the Marines were started by Masons, which is also very, very important for all of us. Now, interestingly enough, in the Virginia Temple is a picture or a window, a religious window called the Ascension. And they got a little white Jesus and all these white people with their hands reaching up to the sky and got a black hand coming out the clouds trying to pull them up. Say something about them worshiping Nimrod and some other stuff in there. We got to do a little checking on that. So we did that, we did that, we did that. Go to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and go right to Meridian Street where the Scottish Rite Temple is and look that the town leads to this one circular center. All of this street is circular, even the buildings in that Meridian are circular. 
Scottish Rite Temple, and all a whole four blocks of Masonic buildings go all down this one street. Anybody been to Indianapolis? You can see it. Go to Lafayette, Indiana. Lafayette. Lafayette is the general. See, we're trying to trace skull and bones in the Masonic activity. When you go to the Virginia Temple, you will see an apron with a skull and crossbones on it. This is the apron that General Lafayette gave George Washington. Who is Lafayette? Lafayette is a French general who came to America and became an honorary American general. Right across from the White House is a statue of Lafayette with his hat off, tipping it to the White House on a horse. You see, Lafayette was a mason, and he brought to George Washington the apron with the skull and bones on it, which is very, very important. And you got to trace out Lafayette connection. And when you go to Lafayette, Indiana, just come to Washington on the train, up in Lafayette, Indiana, right in the middle of the meridian, and there was a big obliques and triangles all the way down the city. I said, what's, where we at, where we at? He said, Lafayette, Indiana. I said, damn. That's where Purdue University is at, but it's all Masonically coded, which is important. We need to check on those things. Did that, we did that. Uh, oh, also, in the Skull and Bones Clubhouse, they got the bones of Geronimo and Pancho Villa. We need to find out why. But we do know from reading the book, the Masons that found the tree, that Pancho Villa was a Mason. So we need to, in fact, Lewis and Clark, who were the little explorers that did all of the pioneering, they too were Masons. Houston, who the city of Houston was named after, was head of all of the Masons in Texas and Mexico. I mean, we might not understand it now, but much of this is deeply coded. And all we got to do is uncodify it. Let's see here. We did that, 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 we did that. We did that. We did that. Got the clear house for y'all. We did them too. Uh, we didn't do that one. We'll say that. Now, let's see. I think we got all of that. The Scottish Rite magazine is now called Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. It used to be called New Age. But a white woman wrote a book, Constance Cummings, or Constance Mullins, or whatever her name was, wrote a book about the New Age movement conspiracy, and they changed their magazine's name from the New Age to Scottish Rite. Would you, how they want to beat the pressure of being identified. In fact, we went to that Masonic temple and asked for some books they wouldn't sell us. And there's an old brother, well, no, I don't even need to say it. I don't need this. No, see, 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 we got some information we weren't supposed to have because by pressing the white boy for it, though he wouldn't give it up, God sent somebody to us with all the information we were denied. All we had to do was go in the back. <laughs> And they thought the boy wasn't doing nothing but clean the floor. He looked like nothing to them. He took us in the back, gave us boxes of books. Now I need to hurry up and stop soon, because by the time I finish this lecture, there'll be nobody here to steal to buy tapes. <laughs> and all I'm trying to do is give a strong enough lecture so that you can support the people here who had the decency to support me. It'd be a lot easier for me to stop now, save my breath, save their time, cut the lecture short, cut the thing, and do sit like, well, I'll tell you the rest next time. Shit, we don't never know. Might not never be no next time. I'm not going nowhere, though. <laughs> hey, 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 what's the Paris Club? Anybody here know what the Paris Club is? The Par and nobody know what the Paris Club is? The Paris Club is the group of bankers that meet in Paris, France, that decide which country get loan money. You should never be fighting white supremacy and not know who the bankers are that decide which country lives or dies. You see, right now, New York is being strangled because the bond buyers are really the ones that run the city. The bond buyers, the piper, they're the ones that call the tune and when your city starts a year, it doesn't have the money, so it goes to the bond market to borrow this money to, so that then it is offset by the fees that are collected from you during the year. Right. Now, these uh, bond buyers lend in consortium, which means though Lazar, Ferrer, Solomon Brothers, Prudential, Beige, and uh, American Express, Kuhn Loeb, whoever the fuck they are, Smith, Barney, and 
Merrill Lynch, all of them that appear to be competitors actually lend in consortiums, which means though they appear to be competition, they all work together. Now, what's wrong in our community is that the financial giants are underestimated and they're not given the appropriate attention so that we can put the pressure on them. Why? I suspect that the richest, most powerful white people that we're after are the least protected. You see, they live in faraway places, on roads and highways, usually with no lights, in the states big and long with little security. In fact, on the day Mr. and Mrs. Daisy's driver don't show up, and the cook don't show up, and the lawn boy don't show up, and the phone answerer don't show up, and, and all of the rest of them, then that's the day we got them. Learn to do things in bad weather. Learn to do things in bad weather. Don't, when the weather get bad, take your ass inside. When the weather get bad, that's God even in the score. So what happens? They wanted to bomb our rock one day, but the weather was too bad, they couldn't see. Well, when the weather's bad, the police can't come and help them because there's too much snow, if it's snowing. And it's too much rain, and they can't get to all the places at once. So you might need to base you an attack based on a weather forecast of bad weather. Now this is cold talk, everybody, everybody don't care about the moment that we may need to understand about when we need to pull it off. You see, I say that this beast will sit in his crown chair in 1992, right? So to sit in it, he's waited all these years, you know, it's like a, like a guy winding up for a punch, you know? He done went all the way around and now he's way up here. And all he's got to do is come down on you, right? But he's so up here, he's committed. In fact, if you want to shoot somebody and they was running on a racetrack, you say, well, I'm going to stand here in the stretch. I think he got to come this way. <laughs> now, this is cold talk. Everybody ain't going to understand this now. I just said, for the ones that will understand, when might be the moment? So the boy is coming with the right. Now he's committed. He's way up top. And we just pop him while he can't do nothing but come down. And when he comes down to hit, he gets pushed off of his target and don't hit nobody. Or he's 500 years to sit in the crown of his chair. Y'all know when we was little, we used to put tack in each other's chair, right? So what we would do is, when everybody knew there was tacks going around, they would look in the chair first, right? But then there'd be a point where you just let your ass go sit, right? So the white boy gonna sit in this thing in 1992, right? But don't move the chair until he's committed off his feet. There's a moment when we can get him, but we got to get him when he thinks it's not, but no other way for him but success. At that moment, at the height of his moment, now Margaret Thatcher was one of the greatest of all of the white supremacists. She fought Qaddafi, she did anything they ever asked. But when they told her centralize that money, she said, I won't lift my skirt up. She said, now Majors can take his pants down, but I ain't lifting my skirt up. No one will ever say I unified the money on my ship. I know that's one world order coming. So though she was a right winger, she got the call from Ronnie. Maggie, now I take a bullet to know what to do. You might want to leave now or go quietly. There was enough evidence for her to get the word that when the money boys say jump and you don't jump your ass in big trouble. So they contrived the whole thing against her. She said, let's vote on the money thing. They said, no, no, we ain't fucking with no vote. This new world order will not be voted on. They didn't kill so many people to get to this spot. They didn't anything they wouldn't do, but I suspect limited because these are satanic forces we're fighting. So we know that they're limited at best. Now, these satanic forces have a wing within the black community. Now, in good white source, Los Angeles Times, July 18th, 1990. July 18th, 1990, LA Times is a story called, Now Come the Men of Sigma Pi Phi. Now, you need to write this down, because when you come up on Dinkins and he ain't acting right, you gotta have a cold. Sigma Pi Phi is a black male fraternity that was started in 1904. Interestingly enough, 
In July 18, 1990, was the first article I ever saw on what is called the boule. B-O-U-L-E. Boule. It's a Greek word. In fact, in the LA Times article, which was stole from me on the trip to Dallas, tell you what it say. I know it. I said it a thousand times. It says, boule was not an arbitrarily picked word. The word boule means advisor to the king. And it went through a whole analogy. Now I said, why everywhere I went, I said, where's the boule? Do y'all know about the boule? Y'all know about the boule? Till eventually I got to Baltimore and a sister said, my teacher is in the boule because I asked him about it at Morgan State, a black man, said he was in the boule and the sister said, well, let me see your book. See, you know, you know if you're in that fraternity or sorority, you got one of them books. And you got to know your book so you can go over you can't go over unless you know your book. So the sister called me up, I was in Chicago, she said, Steve, I found that professor. He got one of them books and he told me to get his book. I got to go to lunch with him. She said, what shall I do? I said, well, sister. <laughs> she said, I got the message. She said, I'll have lunch with that motherfucker. He won't even touch my face. <laughs> and she had lunch with him and she got that book off his ass. But the book was very, very important because next to the article, that's all the information we had. And the article gave up some information. It said that the Boule was a one secret black male fraternity started in 1904. And some of the most important, powerful black men were a part of the Boule and it gave some names. It said Tom Bradley was in it. It said Douglas Wilder was in it. It said John Jacobs was in it, and Vernon Jordan was in it, and Whitney Young was in it. It said Ben Hooks was in it. It said W.B. Du Bois was in it. In fact, the founding member of the New York chapter is W.E.B. Du Bois, who gave his talented Tiff speech for the first time to his Boule members, the talented Tiff he was speaking of. And we remember Du Bois lasted long enough at the Rockefeller universities, Spelman, Morehouse, and the others. That's Spelman, Rockefeller. You do know that, right? Rockefellers built all of the land in the university down there. Started the United Negro College Fund. You do know that, don't you? They built the United Nations. You do Exxon, Mobile, Standard Oil, India, Amoco. I mean, you do know that, don't you? Started that war over there in the Persia. You do know that, don't you? Okay, got that Rockefeller Foundation and the mother there. Anyway. Um, this, uh, this uh, Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, all male, black male only, also said that Dinkins is a member, said that uh, Martin Luther King was a member, that his teacher, Benjamin Mays, was a member, and basically it mentioned it was many prominent doctors and lawyers, not you, but you just say it. <laughs> that these were the people that the white people saw as responsible for taking over the civic responsibilities of the king. So that's why they get those positions in politics, because as a boule, it is their job to relieve the king of his day-to-day -day supervisory responsibility. Right? Now, we get the Boule book. It's important to know what's in the Boule book because I was just in Hampton, Virginia. When I was in Hampton at Newport News, there was a sister in the meeting that stood up and said, oh, wait, wait, my father is in the Boule. I said, where are you from, sir? She said, I'm from New York. I said, who your father? She said, he on the Supreme Court in New York named Jackson or somebody like that. There's Jackson on the book. He big Boule man. She told me about all the Boule meetings at their house. Is he a good judge? I don't know him. Is he good? He ain't so good. He ain't so damn good. I don't know. Right? He ain't no damn good? He ain't your guy. Okay. Right? <laughs> okay. Now, check this out now. This is what she said. She said, well, do my daddy know what he's doing? I said, that's a good ass question. <laughs> But I will make my answer hedged in this. If your daddy went over, he had to pass his book. Let me tell you what the books say. This is what the books say. This is some excerpts from the book. 
One is the boule was founded May 15, 1904, which means that seven days ago, the boule celebrated its 87th anniversary. May 15th is Founders Day. It was founded in 1904 in Philadelphia, right? By a guy named Henry Minton and five others. Now, it also says in the book on page 28, uh, what do you do when you show it to the judge? You say, uh, can, you want to show them the exhibit before you introduce it. They want to show it says, in summary, Minton wanted to create an organization which would partake in his own words of, uh, quote, ooh. What year was that again? This, hold it, go back. Let me tell you what this doc, this exhibit, whatever we are, 33, this must be exhibit 33. <laughs> It says, his dream and ambition were to organize a Greek letter fraternity. Now, we know we got enough problem with that. Taking African stuff and calling it Greek. Kappa, Omega, KK, give it up. No, it's not too late to change the name. In summary, Minton wanted to create an organization. Now, this is the Boule book. In summary, Minton wanted to create an organization which would partake in his own words, quote, of the tenets of Skull and Bones at Yale. He was black. This is a black male fraternal order starting in 1904, wanting to base itself on Skull and Bones started in 1832. Ooh, okay. Now, so the book one says that there's a relationship between the boule and skull and bones. Let's get to another part of what it says. It also says that it's an interesting phenomenon about the boule. It says, you know, the boule started in 1904. The NAACP and the Urban League started only years later. The other black male fraternities and black female sororities actually were founded with the sanction of the beast to counteract the grassroots movement of Marcus Garvey. That's right. Mm. That's right. Mm. That means that the boule, the have a little, want some more Negro system, which is still here today, was built to counteract a movement a million strong. No radio, no TV. Five million strong. Five million strong. That the Rex right? Five million strong. Now, what do that mean? Now, the Zeta chapter is the New York chapter. I think it was about the sixth chapter started. Let me tell you who was in the founding of that, just because we got to name the names. And so we'll name the names of who was in the founding of that, so that when everybody go back and tell what they heard, they can tell the names that we said. I can miss something here. Give me a second now. Maybe you don't want me to find it. You want me to find the list? All right. Find that list, got the Boule, the New York chapter, the Boule names. Du Bois was the founding member. I know it's around here somewhere. Can't get away. Come on out of here. The people want to hear you. Hold it. I think you might be in here. That's an original brother. I'm doing my best, brother. This is a, sometimes it's hard work to find people, brother. I tell you the truth, they don't always want to do right. Because once you put the information in their hand with the names, now there's no excuses. So they never want to get to that spot, because that's when you see when they're really made of what they say they are. Say, let me see if we got it here. This is the list. Oh, nope, that's the index. Got to find it. Got to find you here somewhere. Oh, here we go. Didn't get away. Didn't get away. Here we go. Those are blue and white. Uh, it says, in the, this is from their book, in the heroic age of Greece, there was the boule of the Council of Chiefs, men who, like the king, advisors, were to be traced their descendants from the gods. And who knows? But that of the divine inheritance has been transmitted to us who constitute the membership of the Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. Each member is called an archon. Archon? How do you pronounce it? Is that right? Archon. Archon. No man could be a member of the Boule in Athens unless he were brave in war, wise in counsel, and eloquent in debate. So that's what part of their dialogue. This is one of their books, the Boule Journal. The charter members of New York were James Anderson, B.A. Wilberforce University, John S. Brown and Charles Burroughs, B.A. Wilberforce University, George W. Crawford, B.A. Talladega College, Yale University Law School, who was an attorney in New Haven, Connecticut, W.B. Du Bois.